there, welcome to Look Who's Watching. My name is Isabella Vallette. Today we're going to be reviewing the Australian film The Dry. I'm joined by Brosa Vard Hello. and Harry J. Wall. Hello. So today we're going to be discussing a film called The Dry. You've probably heard of it. It has broken Australian box office records in its opening weekend. Make money, money, make money, money. It stars Eric Banner and it is based on the best-selling novel by Jane Harper. Uh, apart from being an incredible feat for Australian cinema, it also, I believe, is the only uh, nationwide cinematic release at the moment. You can't stream it, uh, which is an incredibly important event for us in 2020 after so many hours spent at home streaming TV shows and movies from the comfort of our own homes. Uh, it's time to drag yourself out to the cinema if you can, grab a chock top, grab some popcorn. But I already did something today. And sit down in a uniquely American environment to watch a uniquely Australian film. Uh, now, when I saw this film, I was absolutely blown away. I think that the, the first thing I'd, I'd mention would be the Australian landscape. I think that a problem with um, a lot of Australian Australian films is that they can be very self-conscious in terms of trying to capture what it is to be Australian. Yeah, that kind of borderline tourism commercial feel. Yes. Where it's like, okay, that rock's nowhere near that place, but you've got a big uh, helicopter shot of it. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, they just go super Australiana. Yeah, yeah, it's almost yeah. like those souvenir shops on Swanston Street. Like, <laughs> it's kind of not really our national identity. It's what we think other people want our national identity to be superimposed yeah. on top of that. Uh, I don't connect with that. This, I think, had a beautiful balance. It was Australian in every way, um, in terms of the, the story was very Australian, but also very universal. I think all international audiences could really connect to this. Eric Banner plays a federal agent named Aaron Fork, who moved to Melbourne at a young age and has to return to his hometown of Kiawarra. It's a rural Victorian town, about five hours out of Melbourne. It's where a fictional town. Well. It is a fictional yeah. town, yeah. But what was really cool was that it was actually filmed in Victoria. To me, it looks like it's out in Queensland somewhere, <laughs> but it's not. He returns home because his childhood friend, Luke um, has killed himself, killed his wife and killed his child oh, and wow. spared the baby. So, yeah, it's, a, it's quite a heavy premise. Um, he doesn't want to return home uh, because... Years earlier, when he was, I think, 15 or 16, there was another um, death in town, yeah. which involved his other best friend, Ellie Deacon. Uh, and it's a bit of a mystery. He was implicated in the murder, um, as was Luke, who has now killed himself. And he believes that the two murders are connected and starts to investigate it alongside the local cop. Is he returning to investigate or is he returning to finish the baby because they left the baby alone? That's definitely not what he's doing. Oh, um, Yeah, I think that's... My hopes wash. Um, Harry's definitely not emotionally okay. <laughs> Harry's not well. He returns in capacity as a friend, um, but then the parents of Luke, who um, don't believe that he killed himself and his wife and his child, and they ask him to look into it in a professional capacity as a kind of personal favour. So he thinks he's only going to stay a night, but he continues to stay, and uh, he ends up kind of personally involved in professionally investigating the case. So he's unofficially not on it, but yeah. he... Uh, he's using expertise and experience. Yeah. To help out, yeah. And he's kind of our outside eye. He comes in, he's, he's real Melbourneite. There's even a line in the film <laughs> where one of the characters sort of says to him, oh, I imagine your life is sitting in laneways drinking espresso martinis, <laughs> you know. Uh, but he's out in this country town. What is the coffee like in Kerawara? Is it okay? Oh, I think it sucks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't I, even, I don't see anyone <laughs> drinking coffee in the whole film. I don't even see a single cafe, to be honest. Which, which perplexed me and, and upset me as a, a Melbourne film with no coffee? Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's not really... It doesn't feel like... I mean, he never wears... I mean, obviously, he's a plain clothes detective, presumably, yeah. but he's just in a T-shirt and jeans the whole right. time. And he brings a really relaxed, beautiful energy. He doesn't do much, but he doesn't need to because he's Eric Banner. Mm -hmm. And he's just got this great presence and great body. He does have an amazing presence. Yeah, yeah, he's just... He's really tall and he just kind of owns the space and he's so calm and he's really an outside eye. Like, he's just noticing everything. And apparently Jane Harper, whose best-selling novel it is based on, um, wanted the character to be just like that. So I think it's yeah, right. a very faithful adaptation to the book. Um, what I was saying before about the Australian scenery that I liked so much was um, I think we've become quite used to for crime films and TV series a kind of Scandi neo-noir sort of influence with like yeah. tall pine trees, rain hitting the detective's cars, you know, the protagonist cop is always jogging to run from their <laughs> problems, you know, in the rain. We often see mutilated bodies, often of young women, and I think that this kind of avoided that. I mean, you do 
you, the, the whole film does open on flies around a dead body, but you don't see the face, you don't ever see the bodies up on a slab. Yeah, like, it's, it's sort of, gratuitous. yeah, there's blood, but it's not kind of, there's no, um, what are they called? I, all I can think of is rigor mortis. I mean, post, <laughs> post-mortem, like yep. examinations. Yep. and It's not medical. Um, not as procedural. Yeah, I think we're used to these Scandi thrillers, which have got these kind of, in my mind, these kind of dark blues and forest greens and stark whites. And there's usually like lights penetrating through the rain. Um, and it's cool when you see another country do a crime show that is just as powerful and just as mysterious using a totally different colour palette and yeah. a totally different yeah backdrop and we did that in this when yeah, I say right. we I was not on the creative team <laughs> our country did it um, and it was just this beautiful beige color palette there were sort of images of vans pulling out with sort of billowing sand smoke behind them a lot of the houses were kind of in this beige kind of color palette and all the people were dressed that way it was cool there's yeah, actually nice. an Italian detective series that I used to watch um, when I lived there um, called Detective Montalbano yep. and that's based in Sicily and that's a crime thing yeah, and right. they actually do it really well too in that they do these like beautiful oceans and like sunny days and kind of warm Mediterranean lunches as this guy solves crime and I think it's cool that Australia's found its groove in our own sort of aesthetic. Yeah I mean it's interesting too it's getting a bit of press at the moment but I think there are a bunch of different locations like 10 or 15 locations that were used but one of them was a, a small town uh, in northern Victoria called Beulah or Beulah. Beulah which was affected by the drought and affected by the bushfires. And, yeah. and so it's kind of revived the town in, in, a, in a way as well. And There was also some random guy that apparently hung a Nazi flag out of his town. home. You know, like yeah. they just had everything thrown at them. I didn't know it was going to come off like that. Pretty sure he did. And now they've they finally did. got something good. Yeah, exactly. And there's a township of only about 300 people. But yeah. it's really lifted the town and it's, it's yeah. given them a bit of a, a notoriety, which is great, or a bit of attention, which is really good. Yeah, notoriety in a good way. Yeah. In terms of Australian culture, like growing up in Australia, the landscape is always part of an, an essential part of our identity. Like, you know, the history of the bushfires, the, the dry spots, the desert, all that. Isabella, would you argue that in the dry, the landscape is a character in itself? Yes, it is. Because essentially this murder that happened um, 20 years ago, um, the, the body of this girl, Ellie Deacon, was mm -hmm. found in a river. Down by the river! And that river is now dry. Oh, that's why they call it that. It's sort of very much a part of the story in that he's able to sort of literally walk through that river. And, and the flashbacks are beautiful in this as well. There's a real contrast between 20 years ago when there were rivers and there was water. Yeah, right. that's great. Yeah, and it's, it's very much, I think There's that, one thing I hate. It's when the, a flashback begins and you can't work out that it's meant to be a flashback. Or oh, not. this is so like clear. Need contrast in flashback, people, otherwise I don't know. Because the actor basically usually looks the same if it's playing themselves in the past. Yeah, well, these are on. different actors, yeah. first oh, and right. foremost that kind of don't look that much like, <laughs> oh, except one of them does. The woman that plays Gretchen looks eerily like the younger character that yeah. um, is played by her. Genevieve O'Reilly, yeah. who I didn't realise she wasn't Australian. Yeah, she's Irish. Yeah, yeah, I read that she was Irish and I thought, oh, she she must have moved here when she was like two. Yeah, she started at NIDA when she was 16. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I, there are a couple of moments her Australian accent moved into what I thought was like an affected NIDA accent of an actor, but it was just the fact that she's so good at the Australian accent. Yeah. It's unheard of. That is a special skill. The only actor from a non-Australian heritage I've ever seen get that right was Meryl Streep in Evil Angels. Like, the way she captured that accent was amazing. Capturing the Australian accent when you haven't grown up here is such a difficult task. Nothing's going on around here. It's completely innocent. What I let accent me is ring that? On the side Jamaican? Table. Don't mock me. I don't appreciate it. Can I do my impersonation of a person trying to do an Australian <laughs> accent who's Please. not Australian? Please, Isabella. Because when I was in the UK, this is literally how everyone spoke to me. They go, hi, Isabella. <laughs> and they go, are you going over to the bathroom? I don't know why I said bathroom. They'd be like, are you going to the shops? Like, they always do the kind of upward inflection. Maybe they've just been hanging out with uh, Adelaideans. That's how they do it. <laughs> Adelaideans? Adelaideans. They didn't get our language right. It's the dunny and the servo. Come on, people. Everyone knows that. Yeah. yeah. I think that the younger actors were really good as well. Particularly the girl that plays Ellie Deacon. Her name is B.B. Betancourt. What a name. Maybe not, maybe not a real name. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. But it feels, yeah. It sits out there, but she was really good. She had a really great vulnerability and just looked amazing on screen. And the director too is, uh, is it Robert Connolly? Is that right? That's right, folks. <laughs> <laughs>
Robert Connolly did The Slap in the last few years, uh, but 2001 he did The Bank. He did Balibo as well. So he's done some great films and some great TV. Yeah. Um, the, the Slap, I personally, because I rewatched that per yeah. recently after reading it, that's one and of the. After talking to Liam Neeson about it, of course. Yes, I'm talking like this. I recommended him The Slap. He <laughs> recommended me The Overstory, which I've almost finished and it's terrible. I'm sorry, Liam. I'm, <laughs> I'm not reading any more books you recommended. Oh man, Liam's going to drop off our listenership. Don't join the Liam Neeson book club, is what we're saying. Look who's watching. <laughs> Liam's not watching. Oh. I hope he's not going to come for me now. I've seen all the Taken films. Don't be such a pessimist. The slap is hands down one of the greatest pieces of Australian media I've ever seen. The way it captured, uh, you know, the dramatic nature of the characters, the identity. Even, you know, the, the suburban Australian landscape was yeah. an essential part of the story. So if the director has honestly carried that same degree of storytelling over, then I'm I'm very excited to see this. The yeah, drive. well it yeah, is. It and it's right. based on a novel. And often I think a lot of novels when they're adapted for cinema, tend to struggle because so much of a novel's character is usually through the internal thoughts of the protagonist. And usually they leave that to the actor to kind of you know, communicate through like their eyes or little like hand twitches <laughs> or you know, whatever. And the actors love it, but it's usually quite boring to watch. And an original screenplay usually has better dialogue, I find. This you couldn't even tell. Like, yeah, you could tell by how tight and interesting the story arc was that it was based on a novel. It makes sense. But it, it felt like it could have been written as a screenplay as well. I think the dialogue was good. And the twists are satisfying and interesting. And I, I didn't see it coming. Yeah, nice. I That's feel exciting. We have a really good track record of making great crime narratives. I mean, Animal Kingdom is very internationally recognised. Um, other ones including Two Hands with Heath Ledger in his I younger love. days. I recently rewatched that and it still it's great. stands. Or yeah. Have either of you seen? Um, what's, uh, have either of you seen Going Square with Sam Worthington yeah. and David oh, Wenham? I love that film. That's. I feel like no one saw it. No one saw it. I but love that film. David Wenham in that film. He's brilliant. Give the man an Oscar. He was so beyond words. We do crime really well. So <laughs> the sequence where he's asking for money for the bus in the courtroom. God, <laughs> that is just peak Australian cinema right <laughs> that there. That is so funny. We do crime really well. And, you know, the fact that The Dry is finding such great success around Australia, that it's not on the streaming services, people are going to see it, we're going to see a genre, a genre that Australia does well with a director that has such a great track record and an actor that has such a great track record. This, I honestly feel like this could be a big part of cultural, cultural history for Australian cinema. Mm. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't really have that, that big cinema, but I think, yeah, it sounds like this is something that we should really all stop and appreciate, something we should check out. You're right. Yeah, nice. This is exactly the way that Australian cinema should be going. So the drive for you... 4.5, I reckon. 4.5? Yeah. Not quite a 5? I was chatting to a lady in the parking lot of Cinema Nova <laughs> as I was validating my parking ticket, and she agreed with me. First of all, at the start, it took me a bit of time with the flashbacks to work out who was who and what their relationships right. were. Once I worked that out, I was fine. It's hard to talk about this without completely spoiling it yeah. but there is a reveal obviously at, of the crime at the end of the film you do find out what happened does it turn out Chopper Reed did it is that uh, yeah. Eric Banner reprises look it's role. basically yeah. Eric Banner just goes himself. into a one man <laughs> does he, does he one man show? cabaret and reprises every character he's ever played at one point he's Columbo's investigating one point he's Dirty is John it? yeah he For just does reason. them all <laughs> yeah it's it's a For weird reason, wild Hunt twist no one knows why yeah no one knows why it goes into a one man cabaret but it's I think Eric just wanted to you know just get a sort of acting showcase out there you know get some agents in to see him uh, anyway I don't know <laughs> why else do any of us do it hey um <laughs> And uh, it, look, it ends on a certain note where the crime is solved and then there's a um, release between two characters where you believe that something else has been resolved right. and you sort of sit back into the film and then another twist comes along at right. the end. And for me and the lady in the parking lot, <laughs> we both weren't sure if Hello, we wanted that lot. extra twist. Yeah, right. Reflecting back on it, I'm like, yeah, but also it was really heavy and really intense and a hugely different spin on the film and oh, I would have nice. kind of been happy if it had ended on the first and second resolution, I think. That's how I feel. Maybe All I that's... can think of is the end of the last Lord of the Rings film where they just kept doing ending after ending after <laughs> ending. <laughs> this was a little bit like, yeah, you did think it was over and then there was well, another just twist. Just throw the ring in the fire and end it. It's done. We're all good. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so 4.5 stars from me for The Dry. I think it's exactly where Australian cinema should be heading. I think it looks beautiful. There are great performances and you should absolutely get out to the cinema and support it. Stick around if you would like to see Bros's review of Soul or Harry's review of Wonder Woman 1984.